Welcome to Grinding My Gears, the only insurance content where we insist that our guests turn up drunk and slurring like a London market underwriter. We invite market professionals to nominate things about the insurance industry that grind their gears before my co-host decides which should be cast into the depths of hell forever. I am your host, Ed Halsey, the James Corden of InsureTech in that I'm a bit chubby, full of myself, and I'll literally do anything for a few bob. I'm essentially an ex-Love Island contestant, but with significantly less chlamydia. Um, and joining me today, our hosts, here's the sole reason for the invention of subtitles. And my request to avoid dropping C and F bombs today has left him with a vocabulary of around six words. So good luck. It's Hubs Mark Costello. He's the first person. Hi, Ed. He's the first person to be diagnosed with Twitter thumb and is the Nikola Tesla of InsureTech on account of either his brilliant eye for innovation or his aversion to human hair. It's James York. And we need to keep this intro short and sweet because he's billing us at four grand an hour. It's Deloitte's Nigel Walsh. And I am delighted, nay, overjoyed to be joined by my co-host, who is so rock and roll that Keith Richards is her sponsor. She's a founder, thought leader, disruptor, and in what may be one of the most middle class founders stories of all time, she founded her first business from a conservatory. Whilst no doubt eating avocado and doing her Waitrose shop online, it's Sam White. Now we're settling into this video lark now. I'm getting used to it. I'm getting a bit more familiar on camera, although the technicals aren't going any better than they were at the start. And one of my friends said to me that old cliche of, you know, imagine your audience naked. Sadly, my audience is literally my mum. So we'll bin that off and maybe we'll use my panel. So I'm going to turn slightly naffly and look at them for a moment. And James, Mrs. York is a very lucky lady. Nigel, clearly the Peloton training is working well for you. And Mark, have you had that checked by a medical professional? Because that ain't right. I'm also slightly worried because James, Nigel, if, if the three of us are here, then who's blowing up uh, InsureTech Twitter right now? I'd imagine Matteo Carboni and uh, Rahul Mathur are having an absolute whale of a time. Um, and also, I do not want to wait any longer, though. I want to move on to Mark Costello, you miserable Scottish reprobate. Um, other than direct sunlight, what has been grinding your gears? And I warn you now, if you refer to me at any point as Mr. Tumble, I cannot hold myself responsible for what's going to happen to you in the edit. There will be all sorts of misery laid upon you. So be kind. OK, Tumble. So. Can you believe the level of disrespect coming from this lot? Now here I am, late at night, trying to edit the video to make this bunch of reprobates look somewhat respectable and they're taking the mickey out of me saying I look like Mr Tumble. Now I look like a lot of children's TV entertainers and I accept it. I would take, by any stretch of the imagination, Dick from Dick and Dom in the bungalow, 100%. I don't even mind having Mr Maker, that one would be alright. And going further afield, in the entertainment industry, I've often been referred to as a chubby Daniel Beddingfield. Do you know how chubby you need to be to be a chubby Daniel Beddingfield? But I take it on the chin now. I draw the line at being referred to as Mr. Tumble. And I tell you now, Mr. Costello, this edit is not going to do you kindly. Watch out later on, because I'm going to get my revenge on him. Oh. What's grinding my gears? <laughs> um, so I watched one of your previous um, get into my gears episodes and someone said compliance and I totally agree with that and that's what's really grinding my gears and it's not that I don't agree with compliance but it's the way that I believe it's been weaponized against the client who it was supposed to protect so you get regulation and then that creates compliance regulatory frameworks that every business works to and you get stuff like demands and needs statements and whatnot and complaints procedures and I think a lot of that's geared around not protecting the client, but protecting the business. Um, and I don't think that's right. And I'll give you an example and a personal example of that. Um, my long suffering wife um, uh, left her last company. So she's been there for years, driving a company car. She then gets her own private car and I, I, I'm charged with sorting out the insurance being as I'm boring enough to work in the sector. So um, I took out a policy for her sent in the proof of company car experience to, to that insurer who I won't name and I was really tempted to name um, and our insurance came up for renewal this year we got a quote much cheaper elsewhere so I phoned him up says thanks for your renewal offer but we won't be taking that up can you send me the proof of no claims bonus and their response was no 
And I was like, what? So they said, we'll only match the no claims bonus for the five years if you stay with us. And I was like, sorry, that, that's not how the sector works. So that went back and forwards, back and forwards, till eventually I got a letter from them saying, that's what we're doing. Uh, if you want to take it any further, go to the ombudsman. Now, I know that's not right. Anybody that knows anything about insurance knows that ain't right. But if you're Joe Soap in the street who has got a life and does something interesting for a living, um, what do you do with that piece of information? You just accept it because it's an insurer. Or you go to the ombudsman, how long is that going to take? Uh, so, but most people will just walk away. Because I know the sector, I actually phoned their press officer and said, if you don't sort this out, I'm going to talk about it in this forum that we're in now. But but my point is that, that that's supposed to be there to protect people who don't work in the sector, who don't know the BS that goes on in the background and don't know how to navigate that. What What is the compliance doing in that scenario to protect the customer? It's actually doing zero and it's actually giving the business a weapon to use against the customer to make them go away. Well, thank you for your one, Mark. So any thoughts from anyone else on that one? Silence. So you You've think there should be more compliance, Mark? No, I think it should be different, not more different. Um, and I think that more onus should be placed on the insurance professional to guide the client. So like demands and needs statements. And I don't want to go on about the whole pandemic cover that should have been in place. I don't necessarily think that's a failing of the insurance sector. I think it's a failing of the insurance sector and government and globally. But there should have been pandemic cover in place, right? You know, and, and when it all went the way it did and Hiscox got left hung out to dry, which I don't necessarily think is right either. Um, I was hoping that I would see the big charge in the press from the ABI saying, We've been bashing the government's door, telling them they need to deal with us. And I got we got nothing. There was so, so, so there's nothing. And it's just hiding behind demands and needs statements. It's absolutely pathetic. And you see it time and time again with customers who've bought insurance in good faith and they, they get the demands and needs statements used against them when it goes wrong. That's that's a lot more pertinent to commercial than it is to personal lines. But but yeah, I, I just think that that ain't right and there should be more jeopardy when they get it when, when when people get it wrong so like that situation with my personal lines with my wife's car that could have been resolved a lot quicker if i'm a normal joe soap guy and i don't know how to get that resolved i go to the ombudsman and eventually it gets whittled down to yes you were in the right by that point i've paid much more for my renewal because i don't have the no claims bonus and it's just hassle and time and, and I just think that as a sector, we need to sort ourselves out. Compliance shouldn't be about having a sheet that you tick to say you've done stuff. Um, it should be about protecting the consumer. I think that came up in episode one as well. I know uh, you, you kind of alluded to it and Nick uh, Lamparelli talked about it from the States. Um, and he certainly talked about it from a sense of you know, compliance, as you say, is there for the customers. It's there to make their experience better. But actually, it seems to be the customers who end up with the worst experience or the worser experience as a result of compliance. So it's making buying insurance, understanding insurance and the like all more painful for them um, as opposed to for the insurers. What do you think, Nigel? I can see you. I'm talking away on mute myself. So I've been looking like an empty for a few seconds. Aren't you mixing up here, Mark, though, <laughs> compliance training and this magic piece of putting putting our customers first, which is a lovely slogan, but doesn't actually mean much to many people because they don't read. You, yeah, so, you've, you've just evidenced that they're not really doing that, are you? No, so, so, so that's my point, right? So compliance should be interwoven into an organisation. It shouldn't be a tick box exercise that sits in the middle lane and the customer experience sits in the fast lane. It, it, that, that shouldn't happen. And, and, you know, one of the things about insurance is expediency, right? So when things go wrong, People need sorted out quick uh, um, by the very nature of what it is. And and the fact that the compliance sits here and, and that framework that th that business has taught their staff, the customer complains, the customer complains, 
we take it, escalate it up the process, and then we just fire them off to go and speak to the ombudsman. Now, most people in life don't even know what an ombudsman is, right? Um, so I'm yeah, that's about, my point. I'm, I'm thinking about a solution to that straight away. You do, I mean, I, I work in the industry as well as you know. I'm sitting there going, we've just got to get this whole concept of NCD in that instance away from the insurers, hold it centrally, and tokenize it. Absolutely. Yeah, blockchain. Yeah. yeah. I never thought but I'd I hear think... the, the day that Mark Costello would start talking about blockchaining it. It's I nearly yeah. fell off my chair there, but I... <laughs> didn't say blockchain. Was stable. He did not say I'm blockchain. Big... <laughs> well, I, I have got a post-it note above my computer that just says drop in blockchain at some point. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that's the extent of my blockchain knowledge. Can we use AI with it as well? I think we should have a tokenized, decentralized blockchain powered by AI that's on demand. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> With a bit of machine le learning thrown in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it makes a great brew. That's the Deloitte Girl <laughs> checking, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Mark. We'll, we'll draw a close to that one and we will bring ourselves on to uh, James York. Your moment has arrived. Um, now, what other than the Twitter character limit is grinding your gears? Okay, I'm going to take a deep breath because this is politically contentious but I am going to throw the fractured nature of our sector's reputation into the fire. And I'm going to pull it out right afterwards as a phoenix from the flames and remake it, the shards of our reputation. So let me qualify this. Basically, we have lots of institutions in insurance, all of which are joined by the same gravity, which is ultimately that people trust these promises that we're all selling, whether or not we're a broker, a intermediary, an MGA, an insurer, or the CII, uh, you know, the professionals that work in it. And everyone's kind of trying their best to, to make the reputation great, but at no point is there like a central conversation about whether we should, you know, have a central message for the industry. And look, if I use an obtuse example, the, the government have forced a couple of other industries that sometimes have bad outcomes for people, or, you know, oftentimes are very you know, difficult subjects, gambling and alcohol. You know, the whole sector has these badges on all their advertisements, you know, when the fun stops, stop, you know, drink aware. But yet an industry that's catalogues, you know, literally examples that you could reel off of trust issues from the compare the market fine recently to the issues with the COVID crisis to the mis-selling of banking. And our industry doesn't have a kind of central program of hang on a minute. This is a really awesome product. It helps people when bad things happen, when when defecation hits fans. Uh, and it's become this really anti-social social network. And I think we need to start owning it together and find that common denominator, that thread, and remake the reputation in, in a proper image, which, as Mark pointed out, you know, puts the buyer in the middle. So that's what I want to put in the fire. And I don't think I need to say much more about it because I, I could give detailed examples, but ultimately that's the un underlying truth of the sector. And, and I know that because I've done some public affairs work in the sector with a with couple of roles, and it is quite difficult to get people trusting each other, even from within the industry. If we can't trust each other, how will the buyers ever trust our supply chains? And that's that's got to be going up in smoke. Fantastic. Any views from the uh, rest of the panel on that? Yeah, so so I, I totally agree with that, James. Um, and it is very difficult, right? So it's a bit like the NHS. So when someone has an operation that goes wrong, it's on Channel 4 News, it's on ITV, it's on BBC, it's a constant loop of a story goes bad. They don't report anything about all the thousands of times that people have an amazing experience and their life is transformed for the better. Um, so, so it's difficult, I think, to get that message across. Having a badge that says we're all nice guys, I, I'm just being a bit facetious, but um, I think that, 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 that there's, there's too much um, commercial pressures and people all competing with each other to have that. So I, th I think, yeah... It's difficult, isn't it? It's a very difficult circle to square or whatever. Yeah, it's, it's hard hard to get that message right and what it looks like. Yeah, I kind of I hear you on that. And um, I mean, you mentioned the, the three letter word, which is, you know, the, the biggest insurance program with no limit, no idea of premium and everything else. And, you know, the, our sector could probably really help the NHS in lots of ways. I live in a city which has no A&E. And, you know, how, how hard would it be to set up a mutual insurance company for my town? probably near impossible thanks to all the, the compliance and regulation you talked about. So 
ultimately, we can't join a lot of the issues that the country faces unless people trust us. And that trust, you know, everyone in government is an insurance buyer. Every civil servant has yep. car insurance. And, you know, they're seeing the same thing and we're not having that proper conversation. Oh, I'm assuming, yes, it's Christmas. A&E is alcohol and eggnog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, eggnog. Real good. <laughs> but what, what you're highlighting, though, is not you're not really grinding your gears with the industry. You're grinding your gears with the reputation that the industry has. And to Mark's point, no one wants to go, hey, look at this, six o'clock news, drum roll. Sam White had her broken TV paid out for in 36 minutes, <laughs> baboon. No one really cares because that's what we expected to work, number one. And number two, it's never really there to get you better off than where you started. It's only there to get you to your pre lost condition. Hey, Nigel, we have an entire nursery run about Humpty Dumpty and you have problems with putting people back together again. I don't, I don't understand that. And, and what grinds my gears is the fact that exactly this, we all think that it's not our joint responsibility to nurture and cherish the trust and reputation of the sector. And, and it is. It's a joint and common denominator. It is the blood flow through the veins of our sector. And no, no one's talking about, you know, Piers Morgan talking about someone's own insurance claim. Just a little bit more of a kind of nudge to respectability instead of a fancy dress party. That's kind of all I ask for, really, when it comes to retail insurance. So, so, so the whole meerkat and the bloody opera singer guy right now i know that they're marketing tools and i get that but does that help our industry present ourselves as what we are that we're giving away a cuddly toy if you buy insurance from us i mean what so your your local accountant is never going to say you know thanks for getting your tax audited with us you know you know have a fancy dress costume it just doesn't happen we give away Every year. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine if you turn up to a lawyer, you're like, you know, Sam's buying a, a business, out, you know, out in Australia because of the success of her new venture. And she turns up to meet her M&A lawyer and he's dressed as a chicken. I mean, you would be yeah. out of there, right? And this contract we sell Hang on just a second. I quite like that. I think I <laughs> yeah. quite like Who that. Who came first? Hang on a minute. Deloitte. I'm get, I'm, hey, I'm going to say. <laughs> I also, I also I, think I, I, that I probably, feel... We need to dock James points because that was very clear sucking up to the co-host <laughs> or oh, because of a successful venture in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> unbelievable. I think sick of fancy. Yeah, unbelievable. Well, sorry, James. James. You're not you getting off that. On. Ignore, ignore him. <laughs> <laughs> What's the nickname again, Mark? <laughs> Mr. Tumble. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Shut up, Tumble. Shut up. You're the one He's with good. the spotty bag. <laughs> 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 I oh, do yeah. this, so if I start singing the hello hello how are you song you'll know exactly I've just gone crackers <laughs> God help us you see you're, you're talking about reputation or are you talking about brand because the, the thing for me is the insurance industry doesn't have a decipherable brand of its own and I, I've been saying this for years that actually I I agree that we should all come together to create a brand that actually works from a public persona viewpoint. And in the absence of that, these big marketing engines are going to kind of gather ground. So when we complain about compare the market or, or whoever else, the reason that they're so prevalent in people's minds is because there isn't anything else on the other side. So yeah. is, is, it the, is it the industry that we want to chuck in the fire or is it the is it the is it the reputation of the industry or is it the brand of the industry? Yeah, that's actually a really yeah. good point. I think that's a good point. You know, in order for there to be a brand, there needs to be someone looking at the reputation in order for that to sort of crystallize around it. Do you know what I mean? Like a, a, you know, a forum for us to consider that question. I think you can't make the brand first before you consider, you know, coming together and, you know, nurturing the reputation together. But, you know, like let's take, and again, this isn't me, you know, teasing Nigel um, for, for his work. But I distinctly remember when I was a graduate, I went into a, a freshest, you know, kind of graduate job fair early on. And they were saying, you know, James, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I was like, I don't know. And they said, we're consultants. And I stood there and I was a bit young and, and facetious. I kept probing and it turned out they're all accountants. And that's what the accounting industry's done really well. Everyone's a consultant, but it's a really diverse field where you've got auditors, you've got true consultancy, you've got analyst work. You know, the depth of this stuff is incredible. Yet when you go to the Aon stand, they were brokers and, you know, Amlin were an underwriter and people don't get it. They, you know, 
most people could probably explain the Coca-Cola supply chain better than they could how insurance works. And that's got to be a problem for something so fundamental and ubiquitous. So, yeah, I'm kind mm. of, you, you know, reputation first, brand second. But, you know, you're right. It's a bit chicken and egg, isn't it? So maybe we need the faith first. Well, the chickens mm. are the uh, yeah, in Australia. Yeah, that's yeah, that's fine. He's at the table. <laughs> well, we will move on from this one. We will move on to the next one again. And finally, uh, we're going to go to our, our last panellist. Um, Nigel Walsh, a man as synonymous with InsureTech as Mark is with high cholesterol. Um, Nigel, what is it that is grinding your gears right now about the insurance industry? Enjoy it. Enjoy it. It's almost, it's almost like we prepared this. I'm not almost. talking about big, uh, almost. I'm not talking about high cholesterol. I'm talking about the commentary around brand and reputation. And it all spurs from a my passion for an industry that I genuinely love. I, I you probably won't find many people other than on this call as excited about the industry as I am. I love it. I truly love it. Um, what really grinds my gear is I was speaking to a lady in the States a couple of nights back and we were chatting away. I was asking her what, about her insurance experience. And she went, Nigel, I just don't care enough. And if you think it, I think about that and unpack it a little bit more, you can have the best brand in the world, but if no one cares about what they needed for in the first place, it's irrelevant. It's totally, utterly irrelevant. So rather than spending money on brand or reputation or paying out claims, uh, one of my other true passions is education. So I think we should double down our energy and effort. And I don't mean at our age of 21, but uh, at the age of, you know, eight or 10 or, uh, you know, uh, junior school, kids need to come out of school not knowing about trig, con and sin and all the other fancy things that you learn in, in maths, but they need to come out of there, how to change a plug. What's a bank account do? What's insurance for? What do I need versus what's nice to have? Where do I go to get information? And I think, the, just, I think education at an early age about financial products in general, but insurance specifically, really, really key. And that, that then goes into a more informed buyer as you start going, I'm gonna buy a car or uh, own a house or get a pet or get health insurance. Because I think most of those decisions early on are made in an uninformed perspective where you get the opinion of someone else and if I asked Mark's opinion of a certain insurer right now, it would be a negative opinion, and that would give me a default bad position to start with. I want a solid baseline to go, insurance is here for this, this is what it does, here's what you need to be protected for, and here's some great examples of where it's, of where it's paid out. Wimbledon on their um, BI claim for the pandemic. At the end of the movie, The Impossible, where you and, you and McGregor, I think it is, gets taken off with the plane at the end that says Zurich Insurance. There are some amazing stories and some great movies out there that show you how insurance has come along to help you. And I think we should be doubling down on that first and foremost, making and helping people understand what it's there for, and then that automatically solves all these other issues. Start with the root cause. Oh, it's a great one. What do people think of that? Who wants to go? So I just had this image of the 16-year-old me emerging from... GCSEs, known what a proximity cause was, and uh, <laughs> but uh, it's um, I, well, I, th I think you're right. Um, I, I do think that there is a real lack of value of what insurance does, and I don't just mean in young people. So, as a guy who's done commercial my whole life, I've been to, and now this is me throwing it back at, against our own industry. I've seen clients before when they've, they've clearly didn't have the right cover. And their broker that they're buying their incumbent cover from have actually said to them at some point, well, if I've got this wrong, I've got PI of this amount, so you don't need to worry about it. And you're going, really? Because that's just not right. You, you know, you're, you're just saying, take the cheap deal here, pal, because if it ever goes wrong, I've got PI. I wonder if they declare to their PI insurers that they take that tactic when they're arranging somebody's cover. Um, yeah, and... Uh, I've had that conversation more than once. But I think an informed buyer makes a, a better industry for everyone. You know, of course. We, we don't go to the doctor these days without searching on Google or wherever else you search these days for the condition, for the symptoms, for the disastrous scenario, you know, whatever it might be. We all walk in there almost as as um, hypochondriacs, but we don't think about that when it comes to insurance. We go to a no. search engine and find the cheapest price. 
And how does it help the buyer, right, that there might be five different delegated authorities which really do grind my gears, um, all with the same brand of insurer at the top of the paper and five different wordings all for the same product, essentially. I, I, I mean, that that's difficult enough for a professional to navigate, but what one's the right one? I mean, if, if you're the buyer, you're just going, well, it's that insurer and he sold me it. And, but in actual fact, you might have bought a different product than you did a few years ago, which might have exclusions. That one didn't. Mm. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I mean, um, I, it, it sort of touches a little bit on what I was what I was saying as well. You know, how do we do that, Nigel? How do we educate and, and engage with people not being interested or caring about insurance if there's no, you know, central gravity to that conversation? You'd end up having each shard, each spoke of the wheel, kind of doing its own thing, and then the customers are even more confused because underwriters are saying, "Hey, look at our solvency rating. Look at our, uh, you know, S and P." standard pause rating and you have brokers saying hey i've you know i give advice and recommendations without necessarily explaining that they've picked their insurers from a panel and you know unlike a stockbroker can't actually sell every stock on the stock market in insurance so there's i think it without a central conversation i feel like it would maybe make things a bit worse and mark just to prod you know you know they say divide and rule here wouldn't it this sounds to me like the sort of thing that would trigger even more compliance I mean, I'm not sure. I'm a bit. I'm a bit worried if we try and educate people. So, 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 so again. Ah, you know, like, wow. Well, well, well. Again, James, my point wasn't that compliance is bad. My, my, my point was that it needs reworked to be to to be better. So, if it means people having to redo what they do, I don't think that there's a problem with that. If it gives everybody in the chain and ultimately the customer a much stronger foothold on. Am I in the right position here? Have I bought the right cover? If compliance can help deliver that, then I'm all for it. Um, I just don't think that what we've got at the moment even gets close to doing that. But it goes back to the point around advised versus non-advised. I called my car insurer at the weekend and they, you know, there was a recorded message at the beginning saying, we can't give you advice. Now, again, back to if, if you're uninformed or you don't understand what you're actually asking for, or what you need, you're making some stuff you're making some decisions based on things that you don't necessarily know about. Where do you go for that information? And I, you know, it, so I do think there's an, an opportunity for the for the regulator. But in the, in their defence, I do think they've got a really good and strong form in the UK for supporting innovation. I think you can drive some really cool things out of it. They do pe tr uh, put customers first, whether it's treating customers fairly or dual pricing. They are, they really are making an effort. But unfortunately, when you push you know, when you, you part the waters that way, people will find ways around it all the time. So it's it's, a, mm. it's not a it's not a simple let's move that way and fix it forever. It's on a constantly moving target. Yeah, I I agree with that. And probably the FC are massively underfunded. Um, I'm I'm saying probably because I can't guarantee it, but I'm ninety nine point nine percent certain they're massively underfunded, and they've probably got more focus on a banking sector that hasn't treated people. Well, a lot worse than the insurance sector has, so 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 I do get that. So so yeah, my my point isn't my gripe isn't with necessarily even with the FCA, but I think that our industry, and um, when the FCA was what most people in the sector said foisted upon us, did we work closely enough through our main bodies with them to get a framework that worked? I don't know because I was not far enough up the food chain at that point to know, but it doesn't look like we did. Yeah, we, I mean, we've got a principles based system and obviously with the whole Brexit thing happening, people are looking at other models in the, the EU they can go and latch to. And I had recent experience hearing about the German model of insurance brokers and they actually have two types. You have a tied agency, which is effectively your, your delegated authority and you've yeah. got your broker and actually even then, you know, you just turn up to a civic institution and, and they, you know, they'll, they'll stamp you through and make you an insurance broker. It's not regulated in the same way ours is. And, you know, Nigel's kind of right. I, I don't think people even get the difference between what advice and non-advice is. And again, no. it links to your thing, Mark, you know, you're trying to be compliant, but you're not doing it in a human way and decoding it. And, and it's not even jargon. It's just a different language to most people. So again, yeah. my worry is in a principles based system, uh, the regulator is reactive rather than proactively doing stuff. And it's under resourced, you say, and, and I echo both of you. None of us in the sector should have a particular problem with the FCA's approach. It's really open and innovative. The yeah. question is, it, you know, it's up to the sector, I think, to start you know, having a common conversation. And if you were the government right now, 
and you wanted to talk about changing the insurance sector, who would you go to? Where would you yeah, go? Exactly. Who would you yeah. talk to? So mm -hmm. that's my point about the reputation <laughs> establishment about brand. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 Nigel, I, this guy, this guy here. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> four grand an hour. We start task. Yeah, we well, no, if it's eight. the government, it's got to be at least forty. On that note, it does go back to not the score points, but on that note, we've got to sort out the root cause. <laughs> we've got to help people be more educated about what they're buying and why they're buying it and why they need it before you go solve anything else. Then go put the brands around them because then you can decipher as an individual with an informed choice that says, I actually understand what a no claims discount is. I understand what the rules broadly are, whether I should get a, a certificate or not, or what I should get. But can make those things simple, uh, easy to understand so that you can, you know, my 12 year old or 11 year old can understand them quite easily and we'll, we'll all be in a much better position. Well, I'm going to have to draw this to a close. I'm going to interrupt at that point, I'm afraid. Um, so we've heard all of the arguments, but now we do need a subtle, well-reasoned and delicate co-host to pick this apart and make a decision. Unfortunately, we haven't got one of those, but um, Sam, are you are you happy to have a punt at it? <laughs> yeah, I'll definitely have a go at that. I'm not 100% sure which <laughs> what the arguments are at this point because we've debated it so hotly. I think chucking... <laughs> Mark's regulation and compliance into hell could have me in serious trouble with the FCA. So, Mark, I'm sorry, but for my own safety and well-being in the future, that I can't go with that. I'm very torn between James and Nigel. I, I get James's point with regards to the reputation. Nigel, I, I'm not sure what we're throwing into hell. That's the 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 only question is it the complexity of insurance what what's actually going into hell to be replaced with something better is it is it lack of education around insurance nigel is that yeah is we're, it? we're gonna throw it to hell yeah our lack of education and awareness at an early age so that we we come into insurance required life informed rather than misled perfect I quite like the 1984 nature of us brainwashing children from a young age into the insurance sector so that we can get more talent in. Um, so I think it's going to have to be Nigel. Ed. <laughs> I'm in. <sighs> We're never going to hear the end of this on Twitter, are we? On the... <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sam. It was close. It was close. Close doesn't Jeez. cut it. It's, uh... oh, now need a common institution to enact this great PR campaign that Nigel's was talking about. So that's good. <laughs> James, next time you go to a student <laughs> fair, ne next time you go to a student fair, they say, what do consultants do? Just point them to me. It's okay. I'm okay. I will do. Okay, thanks. I think they're all they don't think that all they do is ride bicycles all day, Nigel. <laughs> <laughs> Shh. I'm working very hard, Sam. It's very hard work. Well, that brings us <laughs> to the end of the show. <laughs> very post haste um well done to nigel you are today's winner and our most persuasive guest with lack of education around insurance i have no idea what's going to be going on at the screen at the moment but there will be some kind of graphic going on that's burning education and insurance visually um to to make a point um, God knows what I'm going to do with that. I've set myself a challenge there. Um, if anything in today's episode has offended you, there has been some language. There's been there's been all sorts going on. Please do send an email of complaint to uh, grow up at youmassivesnowflake.com and we'll be sure to send it onto our junk folder to have a look at. However, if it has made your day today and you've really enjoyed it and want to support the channel, please do subscribe here. I'm hoping something's popping up on the screen right now that you can click. If it's not, this is just me holding a random finger in the air um, and maybe consider donating a few quid into our Patreon page listed in the description below. Yes, we've sold out 100%, but I need to start funding things. Thank you to Mark. Thank you to James and thank you to Nigel for their suggestions. Thank you to Sam for what did actually turn out to be exceptional co-hosting. Thank you ever so much for that. But most of all, thank you to you for watching. I really appreciate you and we will see you on the next one. Well, you're a glutton for punishment staying all the way to the end, but I really appreciate it. Now, if you want more content like this, please make sure to subscribe over here, somewhere. Am I anywhere near it? Not sure. Or watch one of the extra videos up here. Peace. Free.
gangster. Yep. I'll be on that uh, TikTok soon. Definitely.